Today we're going to look at Genesis through Deuteronomy. This is a lecture on uh, the first five books of the Bible. Uh, sometimes they are also known as the Pentateuch or the Torah. When we look at it uh, as a one unit together, you find this, but we're going to look at the individual books and deal with them on an individual basis. Uh, just as a matter of introduction, the Old Testament contains uh, those books written before the time of Jesus that are considered by the church to be the Word of God, and thus, along with the New Testament, an authoritative guide to faith and practice. Unfortunately, many Christians ignore the Old Testament, even though it constitutes more than three quarters of the Bible, because it is long, strange, and difficult. Uh, maybe you thought to yourself, well, uh, I, I can take a religion class. I can either take world religions, I can take uh, New Testament, or I can take the Old Testament, and I am glad you took the Old Testament. But most people do when they look at that class and they, they say, well, the Old Testament, that must be very difficult. Uh, my goal in this class is to help you to see that the Old Testament is not as difficult as you think it is. It's, yes, long. There's a lot to it. It does make up uh, a three quarters of our Bible. or yeah, It's pretty much it. 39 books in the Old Testament. Uh, it is strange at times. It's hard to understand, but that's why people like me uh, make it their life's work to be able to help you understand. It is difficult, but not really. And so I want to, uh, I want to make it easier for you to understand, even though some consider it long, strange, and difficult, okay? Some considerations that we're going to make as we look at each of these books. Not only these books going along, <clears throat> but we're also going to make these considerations as we look at every book in the Old Testament. How about that? We're going to look at every book in the Old Testament. Uh, we're going to consider content. Uh, what is the book about? We're going to consider the authorship and date, who wrote the book and when. And we're also going to consider the genre of the book. What is the style of literature of the book? So those are the things that we're going to consider as we study this together. First of all, Genesis. Genesis is the first book of the Bible. And as you all start your Bible reading plan every year, uh, you read at least uh, through Genesis, right? Usually you, Genesis, Exodus, and then we get logged down in Leviticus and we don't want to go any further. Well, Genesis is the book that we're usually most familiar with in the Old Testament. That's why in this class, uh, I'm not going to go over it near as much as maybe an Old Testament survey class should or would. Uh, if you go on and take an Old Testament survey class as a master's degree level, or even um, uh, another class that speaks about the Old Testament, they're going to spend a lot of time in Genesis. But I'm not going to spend that much time in Genesis because I'm assuming that most of you have read this book and possibly multiple times. So I'm going to hit the highlights. Genesis, the content. What is Genesis about? When we think about that book, Genesis, uh, the word Genesis really means beginnings. And so it's beginnings, the beginning of the cosmos. So the, the universe and all the... Uh, cosmological aspects of the universe. It is the beginning of human beings. It is the beginning of sin. It is the beginning of God's uh, people, uh, his chosen people and, and human beings, uh, his people all together, right? Those made in the image of God, humans. And then it is the beginning of so much more. It's the beginning of everything. Also, it's about foundations, God establishing a covenant relationship with his people. And so that is the main content focus. When we look at the content as far as structure of Genesis, you can see that it is divided into two major sections, the pri 
uh, primordial section, the primordial history, that area from uh, verse uh, chapter 1 through 11, really in that primordial period, uh, it, it is a period of thousands of years that the book of Genesis is dealing with. Generation after generation after generation, a list of people who lived for a very long time. Uh, Methuselah being the oldest. Uh, and so you have a huge swath of time covered in the first 11 chapters. Well, then you have a patri patriarchal period. And it's only a couple generations. You have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Uh, and so you have essentially four generations. And if you give each generation 40 years, you have a period of, what, 120 years in the latter part of the book of Genesis. So thousands of years previously, now the patriarchal history uh, will say about 120 years, okay? So the patriarchal history is divided into Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. These are the patriarchs. So when you hear uh, the term patriarchs, it's going to be these individuals that we're dealing with. And they are covered in the area of Genesis 12 through 36. This is chapters and chapter 38. Then you have the latter part of the book covering the story of Joseph, son of Jacob, favored son of Jake, Jacob, Joseph in his uh, coat of many colors. If you've heard of that. Uh, and, and so that is how Genesis is divided up structurally. Well, what about the themes? Uh, the theme of Genesis, particularly in uh, verses or chapters 1 through 11, contain four stories that follow a fourfold theme. First of all, the theme of sin. Uh, Adam and Eve rebel by eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, and so we have sin, and then you have God announcing judgment, judgment on the serpent, judgment on Eve, judgment on Adam. They are rebuked. But then uh, a sign of God's grace, uh, God provides a sign of his grace by clothing their nakedness. Remember, after they had uh, sinned, as the Bible tells us, uh, they realized that they were naked and then they were ashamed. They hid and God, and all that, that King James uh, verbiage, walking along in the cool of the day in, garden, in the Garden of Eden and uh, calls out to Adam and Eve. And uh, they hid themselves. They were afraid of God, uh, but God clothed their nakedness. Really, it was the first time blood was shed. So uh, God covered them with animal skin, right? So before they were covered with what? They covered themselves with fig leaves. Um, we'll say they did. All the art tells us, right? <laughs> if the art tells us, that's, that's true. Uh, but they covered their nakedness. But God uh, made uh, clothing for them, and it was made by animals. So what God had to do is God had to shed blood to cover them. Sounds like a... Uh, foreshadowing of something to come. Uh, and then God executes judgment. God executes judgment by uh, expelling Adam and Eve from the garden and to live curse wise. And all of this really is found as the results of the fall in chapters, uh, chapter three of Genesis. Uh, other themes for the latter part, uh, you have a, uh, the, the lives of the patriarchs, uh, those are four patriarchs, God's relentless commitment to his promises. So the example, the promise made to Abraham, uh, God makes a promise to Abraham that he will be a father of a great nation. Even though Abraham is uh, an old man, he's called out of the area of Mesopotamia, he's called out and uh, he's supposed to go to a land that God is going to prepare and will 
prepare for uh, those who will uh, be the result of a union between he and Sarah. And it will be the fruit of that union that God will use uh, to build a great nation. Of course, we know what happens with Abraham and Hagar and Sarah. Um, Sarah tells Abraham, well, go lay with my maidservant Hagar. They have Ishmael, uh, but the promise isn't made through Ishmael. The promise is made through Isaac, the union between uh, Abraham and Sarah, and that will ultimately be the one through whom God chooses to build his nation and his people. And they will be as numerous as the sands on the seashore, right? But then you have the threat. The threat is that Abraham has no heirs and his wife is barren. Multiple barren women that uh, God uses in this time. All the matriarchs are barren. And so that is something to take into account as well. Oh, and then you have the, uh, the fulfillment. God opens Sarah's womb and provides Isaac. And Isaac will be the one through whom the promise is made. So these are some of the themes that go along in the book of Genesis. Authorship, uh, Genesis composition or the composition of Genesis is closely related to the composition of the Pentateuch. Genesis really is that foundational book and everything that you find in the rest of the Pentateuch uh, has its origins in the book of Genesis. When you look at it, uh, and, and there's always scholarly debate about the authorship of any book. Okay, so understand that. Uh, you're going to hear different um, different scholars say, well, this person wrote this, or we don't know who wrote this. Uh, if you if you take New Testament, uh, it's Hebrews. Hebrews is always the book that's in question. Um, but many traditions attribute uh, the composition of the Pentateuch and the Torah to Moses. So Moses, who doesn't show up until the book of Exodus, is thought to have wrote the book of Genesis. Not only Genesis, but also the entire Pentateuch or Torah. So it, let's think about this. So Moses wrote the Pentateuch. That means the first five books of the Bible. Well, Deuteronomy at the end tells us that Moses died. Well, well, how does somebody write about their death? It could be that Joshua, who would be the next leader of the people of Israel, actually finished the book for him. And so think about the authors of these books. The ultimate author of the books, any books of the Bible, is God himself. So, um, sometimes we know without a shadow of a doubt who the author is because we're told and sometimes there's speculation. So uh, don't, don't get too bent out of shape about it. <clears throat> the, the last section really deals with the fact that there are numerous sources and acronyms, uh, multiple sources and edited Material suggests a later redaction and arrangement of a mosaic core. Basically, it's saying that some scholars do say that it is the it is possibility that was later on that it was attributed to Moses, not that Moses wrote it. Okay, that's all that is. Uh, genre: uh, You have the the Toledoth formula which occurs 11 times in the structure, uh, structuring devices of the book of Genesis. Then you have the creation of, and patriarchal narratives have a theological rather than scientific interest. So what we're saying here is uh, these narratives, the creation narrative that you find in uh, chapter 1 and the patriarchal narratives that you find out throughout the rest 
of the Bible begin or the book of Genesis beginning in uh, chapter 12, those have a theological rather than a scientific interest, such as um, the, his, the genre of historical, but uh, motivated by theological matters. The genre is historical, but motivated by theological narratives, uh, matters. So what is being said here is that the genre is historical narrative, but these narratives are written with theological interest rather than scientific or they are motivated by uh, theological matters. And so there is a reason. Like later on, uh, we'll look at the book of Ruth. Well, why was the book of Ruth written? The book of Ruth was written as what is often called a pro-Davidic polemic. So that means that whoever wrote the book of Ruth had a reason, a purpose for writing it, not simply just to tell us a story that is a wonderful love story in the book uh, or in the time of the judges, but they wrote it so that it would connect to the great King David. Because at the end of the book of Ruth, we see those generations listed. Well, Boaz and Ruth came together and they gave birth to Obed. Ruth gave birth to Obed. Obed begot Jesse and Jesse begot David, that great king. So it was a pro-Davidic polemic. Whoever wrote it had a theological interest in connect in writing that story and connecting it to David. Okay. As history moves from a general to particular, so too does the content move from the theological realm to the historical. So what's the overall overarching genre for Genesis? Well, Genesis is historical narrative. That's what it is. Uh, it's narrative. You're being told a story. This is the story of how uh, God created those things, created all things, how he dealt with his people early on, and what he chose to do through Abraham to build a great nation. You're being told the story is narrative. So now let's look at the book of Exodus. Exodus is telling us about uh, the people of Israel who had gone to Egypt during the time in which Joseph, son of Jacob, had been made essentially prime minister. However, a generation had come that knew not Joseph. So the people of Israel became so numerous and so prosperous in Egypt uh, and they became enslaved in Egypt over this period and now an Israelite raised an Egyptian was going to save his people from bondage, save his people from captivity and that of course is Moses who does this. So let's look, look, we look at the content of the book of Exodus. The, the birth and the eventual redemption of Moses through the Nile ordeal foreshadows God's deliverance of his chosen people from the oppression of Egypt and her gods. So that birth near the beginning of the book of Exodus. Uh, by the way, uh, very few, you, you, you get with Moses an opening of uh, that birth narrative and what goes on with the midwives and what goes on with uh, Moses being found in the Nile, Nile River by Pharaoh's daughter and him being raised in the house of, of Pharaoh 
And that's a 40 year period. And then uh, Moses slays the Egyptian and he is confronted by his people and those he sees two Israelites fighting together and he tells them, well, they should be fighting their brothers. And they look at him and they say, what are you going to do? Are you going to do the same thing you did to that Egyptian? And then Moses go out, goes out into the wilderness. Well, that's another 40 years before God calls him through the burning bush. He's out watching the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law. And God tells him that he's going to go and he's going to deliver the people of Israel out of the hands of the pharaohs, out of the hands of Egypt, and they're going to escape bondage. Well, that's another 40 years. So Moses is 80 years old when he goes back to Pharaoh. And then he spends the next 40 wandering around in the wilderness again. I always thought that was fascinating. It is fascinating stuff, okay? Uh, Then uh, content, you see the plagues. Uh, likewise, where uh, Yahweh, Yahweh, this is the name of God, uh, often used in the Old Testament, Hebrew, we're talking about here, uh, judgment, uh, and upon uh, the Egyptian deities, we see those plagues that take place. Uh, then you have the Passover, and the Passover represents the culmination of Yahweh's commitment to his covenant people. Now remember, during the the Passover, what happens is you know, they would slaughter the lamb, the unblemished lamb, and they would take the the blood of that lamb and uh, they would put it over the doorpost. And everywhere the death angel saw that the blood was over the doorpost, they would pass over that home. And so all the Israelites knew to do that and so the death angel passed over to all the Israelite homes uh, but uh, those Egyptians who did not do that they lost their um, they lost their firstborn and so it was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back as far as Pharaoh was concerned he said just get these people out of here right? Like, get them out And then in this, you see that Yahweh as the divine warrior of Israel or for Israel, the received relationship between Yahweh and uh, is defined by covenant relationship expressed in the wilderness tabernacle and divine instructions. God was tabernacling with his people. God sent up, sit, sit, um, set up camp with his people. He was there with them. He was a a pillar of fire by day, a a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day, right? He was always with them. And then you have the Israelite camp that is set around in the wilderness sanctuary with the area in the camp set as ritually clean and the area outside uh, the camp is uh, set is richly unclean so it's unclean outside the camp okay Uh, there's a lot going on in the book of exodus i'm just hitting highlights Uh, authorship date uh, the setting of exodus is the egyptian captivity of israel and no pharaoh is named and there are no uh, historical indicators in the book Uh, there's nothing to tell us a time frame is what is being said but we're 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 looking, so if, if he were to say, you know, Tutankhamun is the Pharaoh, we would know exactly where this book lays. Uh, but he, the author did not. Uh, the historical exodus may have occurred at the early date of the 15th century or uh, year uh, 1447 BC or at a latter date. Uh, 13th century, uh, that is 1250 B.C. Uh, So you'll hear this in Old Testament studies, particularly early date, latter date. That's going to, um, it's not going to really affect the validity of the word and message itself. 
but it might change the context. It will change the context in which that message is delivered. Uh, early and late Exodus dates uh, can be derived from the biblical uh, and archaeological evidence. Uh, so genre. Uh, the book has uh, discrete units like uh, the Old Testament and the Book of the Covenants. And so made within the literary structure, there are dis discrete units of law. And so it's not, we can't just say, oh, it's all narrative. Well, you have narrative up to a point where you have law. And that genre delivered in there. Uh, the literary structure can be divided based on the themes of the book and the uh, Exodus genre uh, includes historical narrative, uh, legal material, and poetry. So you'll have a long period of historical narrative. Then you'll have a section like Exodus 20 verses 1 through 17, which is legal material. And at times you'll also have poetry. It's like later on we study Jonah. And you're reading along in Jonah and you read that first chapter and it's a story and it tells you about Jonah and his reluctance or outright defiance to go to Nineveh. And he says, well, I'm going to go and I'm going to get on a boat and I'm going to go to Tarshish. And you see the back and forth with the sailors and Finally, they just throw him over after he tells him to throw him over and he gets swallowed up by a big fish. And in the middle, and that's the end of the first chapter. And then there's this psalm, which is chapter two, Jonah from the belly of the fish. And it's written in poetic form. Then end of chapter two, beginning of chapter three, he gets vomited up and it's back to narrative. <laughs> okay. So sometimes it happens that way. Next book, Leviticus. Leviticus, the book that nobody really wants to read. Ah, but there's so much in the book of Leviticus uh, to bore us. No, not really to bore us, uh, but to give us a proper understanding of uh, what the Israelite people were called to do and why. So content, you see the holiness of God. God is a holy God. All these Levitical regulations reflect the absolute otherness of Yahweh God. Okay. You have the sacrificial system. Uh, five sacrifices and offerings provide uh, reconciliation and restoration between the worshipers of Yahweh or the worship and others, okay? Uh, also, you have burnt offerings, and these are to uh, an expiate for an expiation for sins committed. You have grain uh, offerings. This is tribute or gift. You have fellowship offerings or reconciliation between uh, God and community, uh, sin uh, for uh, unintentional sins. They give a sin offering, and then you have a guilt offering, uh, reparations for grievous sins uh, requiring an extra 20%. Okay. Uh, I heard a discussion years ago about uh, <laughs> how this could sometimes be Conscrewed. I mean, you think about it, uh, those of you probably grew up in a small town. Well, uh, just think, just think if we have a sacrificial system uh, to atone for sin in a small town today. Say you went to the center of town, there's a great big temple, and you got to go in there and you got to sacrifice. Okay. And um, uh, you see two pillar families of the community go up, and they go up. And uh, one of them has a daughter, and they're pulling a, a cow behind them. They're going to slaughter this cow for the sin that's atoned. But right behind them is another 
pillar family of the community and they have their son with them and they have the same and they have a cow just like that other one yeah, imagine all the talk that would go on uh, this is the high cost of sin all the talk that would go on uh, well this little sis, uh, little susie and little sam uh, they must have done something wrong to have that big old cow being pulled behind them look at that uh so so sometimes that might have taken place uh but we have content content is telling us about uh, these sin offerings right well when we look at the content we also look at uh, the priesthood and the priests and the levites the officiate and the covenantal and sacrificial system often at the expense of their own lives remember uh, they are taking a chance if they're not pure, if they're not holy, if they're not cleansed, they go into the holy of holies. There was a reason. There was a rope tied to them because if they were to fall dead, nobody could go in there after them. They just get pulled out. And sometimes they did, right? They went in there and uh, they did something that was not liked. Um, they were going to go, go down for what they... Uh, what they did it's just a illustration of the power of god and the fact that when they were to enter into his presence they needed to be ready to be uh to enter into his presence right uh, then you have uh, purity purity codes so ritual purity and cleanliness and cleanliness is a prerequisite to take part in the covenant relationship also holy code uh, which refers to the matter of conduct among neighbors, foreigners, widows, and poor. Authorship and date of Leviticus. The context has uh, the Israelite tribes in the wilderness receiving the sacrificial and purity and ritual purity instructions by Yahweh versus Moses. Uh, the events cover a period of one month. Uh, where is Moses? Moses up on the mountain. Then we have compositional view. Compositional views are related to the Genesis and the Pentateuch uh, overall. So the greater Pentateuch is what we deal with when we deal with author and date of Leviticus. Genre, uh, mainly legal. Okay, this is, this is law. This is a law genre. Uh, we have the Holiness Code. Uh, which makes up a discrete unit, uh, but we also have the sacrificial laws, we have the priestly narrative, we have uh, ritual laws uh, with the uh, Holy Code uh, that make up a unified book. Uh, Leviticus is a bridge between Exodus, continuing uh, legal and cultic laws and numbers demonstrating God's lack uh, uh, Israel's lack of obedience uh, to the covenant stipulations so that is Leviticus hang on with me two more books okay uh, numbers now we're going to hit numbers pretty quickly you know what numbers is about numbering okay <laughs> we're numbering the people it's a census we're going to put all the people together. We're going to make sure we got them all, right? Uh, then the, we have the rebellion and the death of one generation above uh, the age uh, of 20 that provides uh, for the life and inheritance of another generation under the age of 20. The spies are sent out. Um, and uh, they come back. They see the giants in the land. Two of them say we can do it. Everybody else grumbles. <laughs> I, I may, I'm making way too much summary, okay? Um, but what happens? Right before they get into the promised land, a lot of people are going to die at the end of the book of Deuteronomy, even Moses himself. Uh, so this is content that takes place in Numbers. Um then you have two censuses, chapter 1 and chapter 26. I prepare the reader for the death of those listed 
in the first and the military enlistment for those selected in the second census. Authorship and date numbers occurs from uh, the second year after the exodus to the entry into the land, so a 38 year period. Now, the narrative is a telescope account of Israel's wilderness experience. What goes on in the wilderness wanderings? Uh, mosaic writing is cited in Numbers 33, 1 through 2. Now, here's what you read in those two verses. These are the journeys of the children of Israel who went out of the land of Egypt by their armies under the hand of Moses and Aaron. Now, Moses wrote down the starting points of their journeys at the command of the Lord. And these are their journeys according to the starting points. And you'll go on and read of the journeys, okay? But the biblical author, the narrator, is saying Moses wrote these things down. So that's why mosaic authorship is often cited. Genre, here's the literary structure, literary structure, uh, geographic structure that you find in uh, the book of Numbers. Uh, it's telling you about the geography of Sinai, uh, Kadesh, and Moab. Uh, this is where they're wandering. There is a thematic nature, uh, thematic structure based on the census and the judgment of the first generations, followed by the census and successful and success of the second generation, the genre can be described as theological narrative. Uh, really, it's, it's historical narrative with theological interest um, of the life in the wilderness mixed with law. So that's really what we get when we get numbers. Deuteronomy, final book of the Pentateuch, and this is really the last instructions of Moses before they go into the promised land. So content, Israel becomes a unified collection of tribes with a national identity. Of course, these tribes are based on the 12 tribes of Israel, which come from the sons of Israel. Who is Israel? Israel is Jacob. Back on into the Old Testament. Um, back on into Genesis. Then you have the centralization of worship occurs at the place the Lord, your God, will choose. And so you're going to have that place from which the Lord God will choose. That will be the place of worship. The land uh, that the God of your fathers is going to give you, this is a divine covenant gift of uh, to Israel. And so all along, God has been pr promising that he will give this land, and he gives this land in the book of Joshua. Right. So this is right before they go into land and living in the land is a conditional gift based on covenant stipulation. So God cuts a covenant with the people of Israel. But when he cuts a covenant, he also says, this is what I this is what I require of you. This is what you should be doing. So do it. Probably. One of my favorite sections of scripture in all of the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, the Torah, comes in the book of Deuteronomy. It's Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel, for the Lord your God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart 
with all your soul and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit down in your house. You shall walk by the way. And when you lie down and when you rise up, you shall bind them as a sign on your feet, on your hands. You shall, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. To me, you look at this and you, and you see that God is calling his people, the Lord God, to those very basic things that they are to do. Um, Deuteronomy is probably one of, if not the most quoted books in the Old Testament often quoted by the Lord himself. So authorship and date. We have three mosaic speeches, and these are and supplements of his death. And so you have Moses speaking. You have uh, the last portion speaking about the death of Moses. So it's a supplement. So it could be wrote by Joshua. Not Moses. Moses wouldn't write about his own death, would he? Uh, and these are set on the plain, plains of Moab in the uh, 40th year and the 11th month. Uh, you know, often we get the idea that, well, Moses, Moses is 120 years old and he dies. Well, you know, 120 year olds die, right? People today, they don't make it to 120th year. But the, the Bible tells us that Moses was not without strength. He could have kept going on, but he had disobeyed God. And that is why he would not enter the promised land. Now, the composition of Deuteronomy has editorial shaping and a longer history. So this is what you got to deal with in this also an authorship and date. Then too, uh, you have to deal with the frame of Deuteronomy 1.1 and the frame of chapter 34 and the book as a distant memory after Israel has been in the land. Almost like somebody is looking back at what, has, what took place through the eyes of what is taking place. And that is why sometimes the authorship is questioned. Uh, also in 2 Kings 23, the, uh, the subsequent uh, Joashic, uh, Joas, uh, Joannic, okay, reform suggests that Deuteronomy was the book found in the Jerusalem temple. Uh, so it is a reference to that book in that material. Genre, uh, Noth's Deuteronomistic History, DH, uh, reflects a literary and theological unity for Joshua through kings, almost like this is a narrative historical leading up to uh, what will take place in the next larger section. Of course, the section between Joshua and Esther, this is the history section filled with historical narrative. Uh, what this is saying is it could be uh, that you could actually hit historical narrative beginning in Deuteronomy. And write it all out. Um, you have uh, observable association with Hittites um, and uh, Assyrian uh, treasuries, uh, also historically. And then 
Uh, you have the three mosaic speeches right there and this supplemental uh, related relating to his death. So those are part of the literary genre. Those are that's a, that's speeches of Moses and that supplement of his death. I, I know this was a long lecture. I, I don't, I'm not making any promises, but pretty much <laughs> it's going to be the long, longest lecture of the class. Okay. It's running 45 minutes. Uh, if you were here to the end, you have preserved <laughs> and uh, I thank you for doing so. Uh, in conclusion, uh, Genesis through Deuteronomy presents the foundational material on which two major religions are built. Uh, both Judaism and Christianity are established by the words written in these books. Uh, these, this is foundational to those religions. And all of what is found there makes an impact on them in a profound way. Thank you. And uh, here are some of the sources that I used in putting together this presentation.